maybe one to another performance clinic. Today, 60 seconds observability on GKE. Um, today with me, I have uh, Matthew Ryder, Ryder uh, or Matt, as we call him. Uh, Matt is a product manager at Dynatrace. Matt, I think it's your first time on the performance clinic. I believe so, at least. I am a first time guest, but I would like to make repeat performances as often as you'd like me. Well, and, that and all depends on your performance. Don't, don't make me regret that statement. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. So uh, also, thanks for jumping in on a short notice because the other thing that we wanted to record today, uh, the, the guests couldn't make it. So Matt, uh, you wrote a great blog post. We will make sure to link it uh, to the recording that I was also labeled 60 seconds observability on GKE with Dynatrace. Uh, please give us an update on what's happening. Give us uh, insights on what this really means. There's a lot of people out there that are moving towards Kubernetes and want to figure out how Dynatrace can help them. And uh, as I said, if folks have questions, put it into the question feature. If you're watching this offline later on on YouTube or anywhere else, you can either follow us on Twitter. You can see our our uh, user accounts here, uh, our Twitter handles. You can also go to answers.dynatrace.com. This is where all the Dynatrace folks are basically watching your questions that are coming in. And I think that's it. Give it a go, Matt. All right. Thanks, Andy. So um, yeah, Andy invited me to talk about Kubernetes, which is a super uh, interesting and exciting topic for me. Uh, I'm a product manager, as he said, here at Dynatrace. Um, I actually am from Silicon Valley, but uh, I live here in Austria with Andy. Uh, and so I work with the, the amazing folks at the, at the engineering lab here in, in Linz. Um, and so I'm really lucky to talk to you about Kubernetes today. It's a really exciting topic. Um, as most of you know, it's where um, much of the world's workloads are moving. Uh, into the cloud and onto this very popular container platform. So I'm going to proceed here. I've got uh, basically three different things that we'll talk about. Um, first, I'm going to tell you the roadmap. So I'll tell you um, what's coming in different time frames, what's coming immediately, uh, and also sort of where we are, um, and then what's coming in a little bit of a longer term. Uh, and then I'll be jumping into a demo. So I'm going to um, show the same types of things that I wrote about in this blog post that I published, uh, I think it was late last week or early this week, which is basically showing how to get things up and running on Google Cloud. Um, and it literally takes about a minute to get things running. So I'll show you that and then show you sort of some of the standard core Dynatrace features that you get and then some of the new features that aren't actually out yet. Um, so I'm going to be giving you a sneak sneak peek at some of the, the new Kubernetes dashboard features that we're offering. Um, and then, uh, as I'm sure Andy does at the end, we'll, we'll just take some questions. So we'll get, get to it. All right. So first thing we'll talk about is, is what's ahead. And uh, I'll begin just by saying that the... You know, th this is one of the most exciting things that's happened in terms of um, technology and computing is Kubernetes and container platforms. And so we're shifting a lot of our engineering focus um, over to these container platforms, especially Kubernetes, but also, you know, some of the container runtimes like Containerd and Cryo uh, and Docker, uh, as well as Cloud Foundry and some other things that they're doing uh, now with the new Tanzu. Uh, release at VMware. So we've got these these different labs, uh, and all of these labs are basically focused on different things. So we're focusing on operators, which is a framework for installing things in Kubernetes, Helm, agent injection. We're also focused on the observer, observability of uh, the control plane, so etcd, the scheduler, API, things like that, the, thing, the, the core components that make Kubernetes run. Um, we're also obviously looking at, at standard metrics that come from containers, the same way that you would look at, at metrics that are coming from processes, which is what, what Dynatrace has been doing for, you know, decades. Um, finally, we're looking at ecosystem metrics and also building dashboards. So this is these are some of the topics that uh, all of us are working on, on, on in many of these labs that are spread uh, primarily in, in Europe, but also in the U.S. 
And we're also working very closely with Google. We have a weekly calls set up with, with the folks who are on the Anthos project, as well as uh, the upstream Kubernetes project. We work with the OpenShift team at Red Hat. We work for my former employer, Pivotal. I worked for Pivotal for about five years and also VMware, it's my alma mater. So we talk to those folks quite a bit. Uh, AWS, Microsoft uh, and their, their Azure platform, AKS running Kubernetes on Azure and Rancher as well. So that's where we're focused. And we're also, as we like to call it here, I think in the States we say, eating your own dog food. But um, here there's an expression, drinking our champagne that I hadn't heard before I moved to Europe. So um, we're definitely doing a lot of that. If you look at um, some of the, the very fundamental things that we're doing within Dynatrace, you know, we're building basically agent technology for a variety of different platforms and technologies. And all of the builds that are running currently, all the pipelines that are building everything from you know, our agents for ZOS, Solaris, KVM, VMware, they're all actually running those pipelines in Kubernetes. And the reason why we're doing that is because we want to basically practice what we preach and get as much experience as possible running on this container platform as we can. Uh, and that's really so we can learn uh, some of the problems that our customers are going through and make our product better. We're also, we have what we call zero day support and it's uh, less than zero. And what I mean by that is that when a release candidate comes out from upstream Kubernetes, we start to um, test it and our pipelines start running it uh, long before it's actually released. So I think today, uh, Google, the, the Google project, the Kubernetes upstream project just announced they shipped 1.18. Um, and we've been testing that release candidate for a couple of months. So long before you get um, these upstream versions or downstream versions on, on GKE or Azure or AWS or Rancher, uh, you can feel confident that we've already tested it and we know that it works. All right, so let's talk about where we are today in terms of our Kubernetes support. Then I'll discuss what um, what we're shipping soon, and then a little bit longer term, what we're shipping. Uh, these are just new features that are going to be available, and then I'll, I'll um, get out of PowerPoint and show you these things live. So, recent progress. Um, these are just, they're, they're sort of wider and narrower in scope. Some of these features are bigger than others, but, you know, I sort of took a, an, a an audit of some of the things that we've done in the last couple of quarters. Um, and basically we fixed um, some things that were basic, were kicking off problems. You know, Davis was detecting problems uh, in Kubernetes. Kubernetes is this um, system where things are changing all of the time. And so we wanted to make sure that Davis doesn't give false positives. And one of those could be the mark for termination. So if, you're, if you meant to terminate something in Kubernetes, uh, it gets marked. And that is a good indicator for Davis to say, you know, to, to know that there's no problem, to not indicate a false positive, because if you meant to kill a node, um, you shouldn't see a problem show up in your dashboard. So, um, so we made sure to, uh, to handle mark for termination uh, correctly. We also now do injection into different uh, containers the same way as we has, have always done for Docker. So we support Docker, ContainerD, and also Cryo. We have, as I said before, uh, now broad support for all these different distributions. So we're, we're testing these all the time. We have pipelines running every day. Um, I call it combinatorial explosion, the number of things that, that we're testing, um, because we have to test, uh, you know, basically give you confidence that things work on these different distributions as well as that the different agents work on these distributions, the different container runtimes, and then finally the technologies. So we're testing you know, Java, PHP, Nginx, Apache, all these things that we support. Um, it's really very comprehensive. And the point of that is basically, so we know that, that our software works properly. So service mesh, um, we're also, if, if you're running Istio, um, we are making sure that those traces are plumbed through so that you can see the transactions and traces properly in, in the dashboard in Dynatrace. Um, so we finished that uh, last year. We have our operator available on Operator Hub, Quay, GitHub, and also the Red Hat uh, Container Store. 
And I'll show you today, we've got the, the cluster utilization and health dashboards. We've expanded that a bit. So I'll show you some of the new features there. Um, GKE, it uses a, a different uh, operating system, containerized OS, optimized OS. So I'll show you that. Uh, and DNS policy support. So those are the things that, that we've done so far. Uh, and I'd like to now talk about the things that are coming out soon. Now I talked about some of these things uh, during Perform, but I didn't show them because it was a little earlier than now. And now we're right at the point where we're shipping them within weeks. So I can give you a, a much better handle on what they are by showing them live. So what is shipping soon? Um, and this is in the 190 timeframe version 1.190. So first of all, full Kubernetes event ingestion. And so um, there are these expressions you can build in, in Kubernetes and you can build them on the command line using kubectl. You can get all of the events for different objects using field selectors. And so I'll show you how those events show up in the dashboard. Um, and that's, that's a really innovative and important feature set. Uh, and you can also use compound expressions if you wanna make things more complicated. Um, grab things from multiple objects, you know, build, build an expression that's very particular specific. I'm also gonna show you a new dashboard, which is like an entry point um, within the web UI so that you can see which applications are running, the workloads that are running in your Kubernetes cluster. Um, and then finally, um, we have generic container metrics. So we have this Docker dashboard and many of you probably have seen that. It's got the little blue whale in it. Um, that icon has become very famous, uh, but this, uh, these, these metrics that are coming through for Docker, now it's, uh, we've made it more generic so that any container runtime on Kubernetes is supported the same way, the same types of metrics are available. So those are the things that are coming out soon. And when I say soon, I mean weeks. Um, so let's talk a little bit about farther out. And before I say this, I'm doing the, the necessary caveats, right? Um, disclaimers. So these are all forward-looking statements. Um, I cut and paste this very long uh, verbose piece of text that I think is supposed to warn shareholders, you know, everything we we're about to say here, don't hold me to dates because we're not talking about when these things are going to be shipped because we can't accurately predict that, but we have at least some sense for it. Um, sorry for the, the uh, long admonishment. So I look at these things like the weather, you know, the closer it is to you, the more accurate it is. And the farther out it is, the less accurate. So enough of that. Let's talk about the future. So um, guessing within about, this is the forecast is like three to six months, we'll have um, support for, for the ingress controllers and egress controllers, the gateways um, for Istio. And that'll, that'll allow you to see again within a transaction view, to see what's flowing through the system all the way um, from, from those gateways with, with network traffic coming in and out of your cluster. So you'll be able to visualize that and it'll also you know, name those components within a transaction. Um, we'll also give you observability to the sidecar proxies that Istio offers. So again, as I said in the things in, in the recent progress slide, um, we support the sidecar proxies so that the transactions are shown properly. But we'd also like to give you observability into those sidecar proxies so that any metrics that are important about how the proxies themselves are performing can be as observable to a Dynatrace user. A little further out um, than the three to six month timeline, we are talking about ecosystem metrics. So that we talked about this quite a bit at Perform. Ecosystem metrics basically means all the things that um, have probably Prometheus exporters inside of a Kubernetes cluster, we'll be able to ingest those metrics. So just raw metrics into a Dynatrace cluster. Um, and what will be really powerful from there will be to combine that with our problem anomaly detection. And then also this, the ability to, to see some of the control plane metrics, the things that make Kubernetes work. Um, so specific metrics about how the scheduler is functioning, how etcd and the kubelet um, and the kube proxies are, are performing. So that is a bit about the roadmap. How are we doing on time here? So we got you do, 20 you're doing, minutes. Yeah, you're doing pretty well. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, it, and I just want to remind people, I know some people have joined late and they were wondering uh, what is Matt talking about? Is this RUM metrics? Uh, just, <laughs> I, 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 posted, I posted a chat message to everyone. So for those that joined late, uh, we, we've swapped the topic on short notice because uh, our original speaker uh, couldn't make it today. So that's why Matt jumped in. Um, and also I wanted to remember folks that you can use the question features in case you have any questions of what Matt is showing, just use the question feature of GoToWebinar and uh, I will uh, put them up, uh, bring them up at the end of the session or in case something comes in through the live demo, then I may interrupt you. But now I stop interrupting you because I want to make sure we are, uh, we're, you know, keeping track of time. That's good. Um, okay, so let's start browsing around. Um, I'm gonna put PowerPoint a little bit lower on, on the page here. Uh, I think I'll turn off my camera, Andy, so that you can see my screen better. Is that is that a good yeah, idea? I've, go. I've just I've just done this for you exactly. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, thank you. Fancy. So I think where I'm going to start here is I'm going to start it in GKE. So let's talk about um, how things are running, what's running for this demo on Google. Um, so here I'm I'm sitting in the Google console and I'm looking at the virtual machines that I have running in Google. Uh, and so what I'm gonna show you here is what's running and then how I set it up. Um, it'll introduce you to the marketplace um, integration that we built for GKE. And then I'll show you the, the core set of features in Dynatrace that this unlocks and then some of the new features that I just talked about. So, um, Right, we have, we're in the compute engine screen here, so we're not in, in GKE just yet. And what we're looking at are basically the nodes for my Kubernetes cluster. I just have a five node cluster running. And um, so you can see these VMs because these VMs are running um, in Google Cloud. And there's not a lot that separates them from the Google cluster nodes, except that these are managed. So I can upgrade these automatically through a different screen. Uh, and Google basically is taking care of these nodes for me. They're all managed. I don't have to worry about them. There is one node that I'm, that I'm sort of worried about, which is this instance one. So I created that myself. That's just the active gate that, uh, where I have my Kubernetes connection um, set up. So let's go now to Let's go to Google, Google Kubernetes Engine, and we'll look at this cluster that I have. So I have this little cluster called MRider Cluster. Uh, it's been running for a week or so, and uh, I set it up last week to do a demo just like this. So it was handy to have it when Andy called me up and asked me to, to do this performance clinic. Um, and let's look at what's happening in this cluster. So the way that we look at the workloads here is we look, and you'll see this an, an analogous screen in Dynatrace in a moment. Uh, and if you've ever run the sample app that Google publishes, it's called the Hipster Shop. And so here I'm looking at all of the different microservices in the Hipster Shop. And um, these are basically workloads. Each one of them has a pod definition. You can also see, and I'll tell you how this, I'll show you how this was deployed in a moment. I'm looking at two namespaces here, so I'm not looking at any system objects. Uh, and the two namespaces are the hipster shop where my app's running and also the Dynatrace namespace. And there are basically two containers that are running here, uh, two workloads. One is the Dynatrace one agent operator. Okay, and that uh, is, uh, I'll show you in a moment, the component that takes care of the life cycle of the agent. And then this is the agent itself. So there's a relationship here between these two components. Um, this will make sure that the agent is running and it will install it and it'll also upgrade it all for you using Red Hat's operator framework, which is now officially um, part of the CNCF. And then this is the one agent, which is just this daemon set that's running on every node. It says five out of five because every node needs it and that's how it's injecting into all the applications. So um, let's really quickly look at the, um, the workloads here. Uh, the front end workload has an external service. 
deployed. And there's a load balancer on it. And I can show you the hipster shop. So this is the, the app that's running. And you'll see a lot more about this app and understand actually how it works when we're in Dynatrace. So it's, it's kind of funny thing, right? It's a hipster shop as a former uh, resident of San Francisco. I can attest to the fact that these things would be very popular with all the cool kids in the city. So vintage typewriter, we could buy a camera lens. Right now I'm actually creating transactions that we'll see in a moment inside of Dynatrace. Maybe I'll buy a vintage record player. You get the idea. Okay, so that's the hipster shop. These are the workloads that are running. And in a moment, I'll show you how we instrumented all of these things using Dynatrace. So um, my blog post says up and running in 60 seconds, and I'll show you how that was done. So we click on this marketplace tab here, and we just search for Dynatrace. And you'll see that there's this Dynatrace one agent operator. And I click here, and I click on configure. And it's loading this form here. And this is all open source, so we have all of this up on GitHub. And you can see that just with a few settings, just my API URL where I'm pointing to, this is either my managed uh, Dynatrace cluster or my SaaS cluster, and the token, and this thing called a PaaS token, which is basically what downloads the, the uh, agent. Just with those three settings, when I hit deploy here, that's what deploys the, those two workloads that I showed you, right? Those two workloads were, the one agent operator and the one agent. And so to give you a sort of a, an understanding of the relationship between these things, I drew this picture and this was in my blog post. So um, this is not only a picture of how things work, but it's also a picture of like the evolution of where our, of how we install uh, the agent inside of Kubernetes. So a couple of years ago, we had the daemon set and we still use the daemon set, that's the one agent. It's sitting on each node, and it's what injects into processes, containers, uh, that are running on that node. And so um, this is like 2018, I think we came out with the daemon set. Uh, and then last year, we introduced the one agent operator, and the operator, like I said, is it's Red Hat's framework for basically managing the life cycle of things. So it's managing the life cycle of the daemon set. You can see that when I run this command, I deploy this purple thing, which is the operator, and that operator turns around and makes sure that the daemon, the daemon sets are running properly, and it also upgrades them. And so what I announced in the blog post is that now we have this Helm chart, and the Helm chart is what we're saying is our recommended approach. Um, so now you can just type Helm install, and you can read about this uh, in a couple of days. We'll have actually tomorrow, we'll have this up on, uh, on our help um, instructions. It's all in the blog post. And you'll be able to very quickly and easily through one command, you don't have to edit YAML files or anything like that. Uh, you can have everything installed in about 60 seconds. And what this looks like in that form I just showed you, it's just using the exact same thing. It's using the Helm chart. Uh, so basically we are unlocking Google Google Kubernetes engine with that, with that Helm chart. Okay, so let's now go and look inside of Dynatrace and um, oop, that's my email. You don't want to see that. <laughs> so here we are in, in Dynatrace. Um, and this cluster that I'm showing you is healthy. There's, there's really nothing uh, wrong right now with the hipster shop. You will see that there's some out of memory errors and that's what I'll focus on in a moment. But uh, overall, uh, the cluster is doing fine. And so uh, first I'll talk about you know, just these core things in Dynatrace that are available as soon as you install that that daemon set, as soon as you've got things running on Kubernetes, and then I'll jump into the new features. So um, this host view is something that many of you are probably familiar with. These are the same five nodes that I was looking at when I was inside of Google Cloud. So I think we'll go to, you know, one of the, the um, nodes that's got a little bit of a, of a high CPU, but all of them, I think this is very underutilized. We're actually wasting money here if we were, if we were um, running this cluster because not a lot is happening on these five nodes. Um, so I'll, I'll make sure to, to turn this off to save money for, for Dynatrace. All right, so we're looking at the host view. Um, we can also see you know, what are all the processes that are running here. These are all 
uh, again, standard features that you've probably seen before. Um, we can look at transactions and services. Uh, I think one thing that's very important about, about this, um, again, is that none of this took any custom instrumentation. Um, so we're able to, to look at the transaction flow of what calls and requests are made inside of the hipster shop without an engineer having to write any tracing code. Um, if I wanted to, you know, I could look at, I think, let's look at the product catalog or something like that. You can see the pure paths. Let's also look at the response times. So the response times of the, of the product catalog. Um, again, these are sort of the standard application performance metrics that you get when you buy Dynatrace. And all of this stuff just works right out of the box. Um, we can also look at the SmartScape topology to see you know, how, how these relationships between um, the different microservices and the transactions and the calls that are made between each other. Uh, and we could jump from this back into the same types of views looking again at response times of these microservices. So um, again, all this works out of the box. Uh, it took me about a minute to set up. Um, and none of this is, is specific necessarily to Kubernetes. So what I wanna do now is I wanna jump into the things that are special and new. Um, and I'm gonna do that by clicking on this little Kubernetes tab. So first of all, um, we're looking at this new, this is the Kubernetes cluster view. And so there are some things here that you may not recognize if you've seen this dashboard before. First of all, we see sort of a difference between what our desired state is. So basically the, the declarative state that we've um, put in our YAML files for how many pods should be out and also can, can compare that with what's actually running. Um, we can also see if we look at the nodes here, so I could analyze the nodes and I could see the cluster utilization um, and as I said, I, th I think I'm wasting money here. So it looks like if I'm looking at CPU usage, so I'm thinking about this in terms of like capac capacity planning. If I look at CPU usage, I've got two lines here and right? I can see what's the actual usage and what's the amount that I'm using. And I'm really not using very much of my CPU. So I'm probably over provisioned. I, don't, I do not need this amount of capacity that I'm running. Um, and we can see on, on the memory side, um, in terms of what's available and um, and what I'm using, it's it's also, you know, I'm I I could cut back a bit. I can also see the limits. So in Kubernetes, you can set up uh, limits uh, at different layers. You can set them up at the node. You can set up um, them up at the pod level. Um, and so I can see here, like, what are the memory limits and how much do I have available? And that. That difference there is something that a lot of people spend time trying to tune, again, so that they can save money because the amount that you're limiting folks should be as close to the total as possible. You know, there should be some slack there in case there's there's some bursting, but generally speaking, you should try and keep that slack at a minimum. Okay, so let's look at uh, some of the new views. That was one new view. We also have this workload view. So this is all new. I looked at the cluster utilization a bit. So this workload view shows me what are all the workloads that I have running uh, in this cluster. And so I have 29 workload definitions. And of those, I have 43 pods. So there's multiple instances of some of these workloads. And then I can look down here and I can see um, how are these divided in terms of different namespaces. I could click on view all workloads but maybe I just wanna see the things that are in the hipster shop. So I'm gonna click on hipster shop and I wanna explain uh, for those of you who are wondering why these metrics aren't showing up is because uh, I'm still in uh, an early adopter phase. So when we ship here in a few weeks, all of this stuff will, will be plumbed through. So this is one of the things that isn't completely finished yet, but what is finished is that I can see, again, the declarative state versus how many of these um, containers are actually running. These are instances. And I could look at something that maybe I'll find interesting like the payment service. So here I'm looking at the process group for the payment service. 
um, and I'm looking at CPU. Maybe I want to look at the details of this group and look at memory usage. And here we see something that's that's interesting. So what I'm seeing here is that the memory usage is actually going up a bit, and it seems to spike at the same time that the instance count goes down. So looks like we're we're peaking, memory utilization is peaking, and then the instance count is going down. And so this will be consistent in a second with the next feature that I show you, which, which are events. But I just wanted to point that out, that um, it's sort of an interesting pattern here. Memory goes up, instance counts go down. And you know the, the good thing about Kubernetes is it handles a lot of these things for you, right? It's gonna restart instances that may be killed, um, but you really wanna keep an eye on why, so that you can maybe reach out to a developer, have them fix a problem, or in this case, we'll talk about what, what would have resolved this problem. And it's not, it's not a critical problem. Response times are still fine. The cluster's healthy. It's just that things could be running more efficiently. Okay, so let's go back to the main screen, the Kubernetes screen. I showed you, again, the cluster utilization. I showed you the workloads. And now we're down here. So if you look at this new, this is a new panel here, and this is the events panel. And so the events panel has, again, something that I called your attention to a second ago. There's 22 boom killing events, out of memory killing events. Uh, what's happening here? So if we look at this, we can see that something's happening where a certain container is getting killed over and over again. And I can look at this through the host view. And I can see the events down here too. And so we saw that things were being um killed. And we can now see that not only are they being killed, but there's other events happening where they're being restarted. And so we see, well, what's being restarted? Aha, uh -huh. the payment service is being restarted. And the reason why the payment service is being restarted is because we're not giving it enough memory. So those out of memory events are, are critical there to see, well, okay, something keeps being um killed. Maybe we need to increase the memory. It doesn't look like it, had a, it has a leak necessarily. And so I wanna, I wanna just correlate these back with what we're seeing here. And this is basically, this is this payment service here. And I wanna look to see how much memory we actually provisioned here. And if those metrics were showing up on the right, this would all be in the same dashboard. But since this is early adopter, you don't have those numbers here. So I'm just looking at them right here. Uh, and you can see that the amount of memory that we've provisioned here is this purple line. And you can see that it's actually using more. Um, and so probably a good idea to go to the pod definition of of this thing and, and bump up the memory. Um, and then maybe I won't be uh, as underutilized also on this cluster. So um, I hope that all of those things are things that you're excited about. Basically what I just showed you, I showed you the lifecycle management for Kubernetes through the, the Helm chart and through the, um, the operator. And then, how after just 60 seconds you can you can get all of these these standard powerful um, Dynatrace core features. You know, you, I showed you looking at those nodes through the host view, looking at service flows, looking at SmartScape, um, diagnosing transactions, and then finally I showed you um, some of the new features that we're coming out with in a couple of weeks. Specifically, looking at cluster health and then also the workloads view, the, this cloud applications view, and then the events to see what's happening. And we saw that uh, some weird things were happening, that some containers were being killed over and over again. So that's uh, that's where I'll finish up, Andy. Yeah, yeah, very cool. Thank you so much, Matt. Matt, it's time to turn on the camera because now we're going into Q&A mode. Before we go into Q&A mode, can you do me a favor to switch to the last slide or the, like the next slide, just some um, things that I want people to understand. There's a lot of content out there that we have uh, either on university, on the YouTube channel and so on and so forth. Also make sure that you get your Dynatrace SaaS trial in case you haven't seen the announcement that we as Dynatrace have done around COVID 
uh, the trials now are running longer, uh, especially I think for RAM uh, and for some other key features to uh, give organizations that are struggling now to keep their digital service up and running because of the increased spike in demand that they can use Dynatrace for monitoring them uh, for free. And I think that's that's a great offer. So get your Dynatrace trial. Now, uh, there's a couple of questions that came in. I think some have been answered already in the slides, but I still want to go through them. In the in the very beginning, you talked about the platforms that are supported, and the question from Sasha actually was whether the CASP, uh, the SUSE CASP uh, cloud platform uh, is supported, yes or no, and I believe you, you answered that in the slides at least with a yes. That's right. Um, we okay. do support SUSE CAS, and um, Again, we haven't published the new uh, installation instructions for the Helm chart and, um, and how it works with the operator, but we were very careful to include the special instructions that you need not only for GKE and Anthos, but also for CAS, because they're the same, which is basically um, you just have to add a little YAML snippet uh, that attaches um, the volume to your custom resource. So um, anyhow, yes, Perfect. the answer is yeah. yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the next thing, and also it was on the same slide, it was your first bullet point where you talked about the mark for termination. So we are now understanding if certain pods are marked for termination and then we're not alerting. I wanted to actually chime in here because I know there's a general event API where whether you're on Kubernetes or anywhere else, if you have any environments that you know you're shutting down, whether it's a host, whether it's a process, whether it's a service, you can use the events API in Dynatrace and send a mark for termination event. So Dynatrace understands that this entity is going to go away and that's just as expected. I think that was something that people may not be aware of that we have an events API for mark for termination. Um, the other thing, uh, you talked a lot about um, uh, you know, using the, the data that we have for capacity planning, right? You mentioned multiple times that you are wasting a lot of money here for Dynatrace because you're running all these clusters. <laughs> I don't feel good about it. So after the demo's over, no more right. money will be wasted. Yeah. <laughs> That's okay. No, but on a serious note, uh, these, these metrics are great in the dashboards. The question is, uh, are these metrics also available via the API? by the metrics API? Yeah, all the metrics that you're seeing um, are available in, in different ways, right? So right. one is through the dashboard and one is the other, the alternative is through the API. Perfect, okay. Yeah, and this, you know, you should uh, folks check out also the, the metrics V2 API. We, there was a major upgrade of our metrics API recently where you can uh, pull uh, the data uh, from from Dynatrees in a very efficient way with cool query languages that you can uh, that you can specify. The other thing, so you showed the new way how we can deploy the one agent. Um, you showed the marketplace, your 60 seconds. So by the way, awesome, right? I believe you, uh, 60 seconds. Uh -huh. uh, it was actually a minute. Three seconds, so 63 seconds. <laughs> okay, that's, that's, that's within the uh, the, uh, the, the expected yeah. uh, boundary. So it's not an anomaly yet. But there's two questions yeah. actually here. The first one, uh, does this install, it does this installer approach also configure the Kubernetes and API endpoint to pull in all the data that you show? Or do you still need to go into, the, into Dynatrace and configure the Kubernetes API yourself? Yeah, so it it is only installing the the one agent, and the one agent is injecting into containers. So you'll mm -hmm. see all of the the you know transactions and all those standard features. Um, you still need to connect to the API the same way that you did before, which is why I have that active gate sitting there. Um, mm -hmm. Is because that that uh, extension, the Kubernetes extension, is turned on at the at the active gate level. Um, yeah, we are. We are going to make this stuff much easier, and that's if we look at how the teams are sort of split up. That's my role is to try and make this really easy and enjoyable for someone to set up. Um, as a product person, that's what I'm focused on, um, and so we're going to be containerizing some of these components and doing the same sorts of things that we're doing for the one agent, <clears throat> um, building an operator and Helm charts, things like that. Uh, I also don't have a time frame for that, but we're we're looking at, uh, you know, hopefully later this year. Yeah. So that means the one agent operator 
would then not only install the one agent, but potentially run an active gate on Kubernetes as well, and then just pull in the API and things like whatever, however you do it, but that makes Yeah, uh, to be to be specific, it would, there would actually be two operators. <laughs> there would be one one for the one agent and one for the active gate you know, to Perfect. handle all the plugins and extensions and routing. Yeah. Cool. The next question also to the installer. Uh, Joe is asking whether he installed the operator via the, the uh, described approach on GitHub. Is there a way to upgrade to the Helm approach, to the Helm chart? Yeah. Yeah. So as I said, I, I'm hopeful that tomorrow you'll see I'm working with our docs team really carefully. Uh, and we're, we're right at the point where we want to publish it. The only thing we were waiting for was we wanted all of the arguments in the Helm chart to be the same as the parameters that you can put in the YAML file for the operator. Uh, mm -hmm. And so we actually, we did something cool, which is you can now say that one of the parameters, one of the options you can set for the Helm chart is you can say platform equals Kubernetes, or you can say platform equals OpenShift, and it'll generate the right YAML files for both platforms, either one. So okay. that was the last change we made. We made that, uh, one of the engineers on the team, Marco Mater, made that change yesterday uh, and he uh, published it out. So it's on GitHub, it's just not, it's not documented yet and we're hoping to do that tomorrow. Perfect, awesome. Uh, next question, um, and this also comes from Joe. And Joe, I asked you a follow-up question, I'm not sure if you've seen it, but I'm reading out the question as you posted this. Uh, having issues with the Kube proxy service keep logging problems in Dynatrace due to the connectivity or unavailability, kind of the container getting thrown away. They're running on AKS three nodes, uh, if that makes any difference. So, I mean, the question that I had to him, do these problems only come up once Dynatrace is installed or is he just asking on what to do with these problems? I'm not sure, maybe you better understand the question. Well. Um... There's a there's so many uh, things that happen on a moving platform like this, and lots to keep track of. So I can't say offhand that I know what the problem is, but what I can say is that it's my privilege to talk to to our customers, and I invite people who are who have questions or problems, or even just want to uh, chat about their use cases, to get in touch. Um, and I think the the sort of official means to do that maybe through the support system. Um, but you're welcome to reach out to me directly. You can reach out to me on Twitter or mm -hmm. you can email me directly also at matthew.rider at dynatrace.com. Mm -hmm. So Joey's just saying he's getting um, he's getting these uh, errors actually in the one agent log files and he's been, so Joe, maybe like really let's follow up. Um, either Joe, you know Matt's name and email now, he just gave it to you. Maybe you can just, yeah, perfect. He's just saying he's going to email you directly. That's great. Let's yeah. talk. Make another customer happy if you solve the problem. That, that's what we're in business to, to try and do. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, another thing, you, um, if you could do me a favor, can you go back to your Dynatrace environment? Yeah. So okay. if you go to the uh, new Kubernetes uh, screen again, you had uh, you showed the number of of pods, so the the workloads. Can you? The question is, can you tell a little bit more on what we are seeing here uh, on the cluster workload? Because it seems you talk about workloads, you talk about pods. Uh, it's just the number of pods. Is the number of pods and workloads, or is there any more information about pods available, or is it or is this coming? Um, well, I mean, you can see the workloads and the state of them here, and you can see the types of workloads underneath. This is really, you know, it would give you one indication of, of whether there's whether there's a problem. Um, to be perfectly honest, there is no problem here, and this should be 43 and 43. But since we're in early adopter mode, um, the reason why these don't match right now, I think is because if I look at the running pods, let's see in maybe it's in kube system yeah so if you look here this is just something that that we're going to clean up before we ship which is that the static pods are not 
showing their desired state, they're just showing their actual state. So once mm -hmm. that's finished, those pod numbers would match. But if Perfect. they didn't match, you'd probably want to know why, right? Like yeah. if there's if there's a delta between those two numbers, you you would definitely want to look look into it. And that's actually follow-up question is just coming in. Are there any plans that Dynatrix can alert on if you don't get the actual pods to be the desired number of pods? Yeah, so um, alerting it will, th these these things will all be metrics, right? So you can alert on things the same way that you alert on, on anything. Um, in terms of problem detection, things like that, that's going to come later. So there's mm -hmm you're building things by hand and then there's you know the davis engine detecting anomalies uh, and those things are are going to be rolled out you know incrementally as the year goes by mm -hmm. really cool and uh, it's also great as you mentioned earlier everything you see here these are all metrics that you can just access through either the metrics api you can build your custom dashboards so it's all it's all there for you hey um I actually need to soon jump over to the next webinar because we're doing a captain community meeting today in about 10 minutes. So for folks that are still on the line, if you want to uh, join that, uh, I definitely need to cut it short. But Matt, thank you so much for, for jumping in. You clearly uh, earned yourself another slot on an upcoming performance clinic. So job well done. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, and I look forward to hearing from everyone who was who had questions and and please reach out if you have other questions or issues or things you want to talk about. Yeah, and as a reminder for everyone, this is recorded. Put it up on YouTube. We'll put it up on Dynatrix University. And once Klaus is back uh, healthy, we will uh, record the initial session, which was around Dynatrix RAM calculated metrics. All right. With that, uh, stay safe, stay healthy, um, and au revoir. Cheers. Okay. Tschüss. Auf Wiedersehen.